Hi guys, as you can see, it's uh, it's another beautiful day in Panama City, Panama, and this is uh, this is on the 21st of November when we're heading to the Star Wrap and um, Porta Ka uh, Porta Kati, uh, which is an indigenous uh, uh, jetty, uh, but it's actually in a um, in an area called uh, Kuna. Now let me remember it. Um, Guna Kala is the name of the region, and um, it's a uh, it's a an indigenous region that's been set aside by the uh, by the Panamanian government for these the indigenous people there, and they sort of control it all themselves. But we met we met a few characters here. There's a, a, a guy, a, a German guy, he used to be a, a, super, a German superbike rider. He was out front, and he was absolutely flying. Um, and in the wet, you know, it, it was pretty crazy. And um, we, uh, and, and the thing about it is, there's no maps to this region. There's no road maps. There's nothing. Um, I'm, I suppose you could purchase something somewhere, but I, I, in the time that I looked around for um, any maps to that region, there was nothing. So we ended up going, uh, following him, hoping he knew where to go. And the, the they actually gave us some decent directions. Uh, the the crew of the of the Star Rat, um, and I've written in in my blog post. I write about uh, the process of getting to the Darien Gap. So we all, we all met up at a place called the Panama House Bed and Breakfast, and that's basically, I mean that that's what the people from Star Rat tell you to stay. And I didn't stay there, but a few of the writers stayed there. They said it was just pretty average. Um, and I, I went there because we were waiting around for some of the guys to get ready. I got there at about uh, first light, about 6.15 a.m., 6 a.m. We didn't end up leaving there till about 6.45, 7 a.m. But um, yeah, that, I had a look around the place, it looked pretty average. But it was, I mean, it's pretty hard to say because it's so wet and, you know, so wet and pretty pretty miserable. Um, just trying to think, is that, there? Yeah, that's the German up the front there. He was a pretty funny guy. Um, but he, yeah, he, and and because of because of uh, he was weaving in and out, trying to let him go. <laughs> uh, he's weaving in and out of traffic. Uh, I don't, know, I don't, I don't actually think that's him there. I think he might be further up. Uh, yeah, he's right at the front there. Um, sorry. Um, and there's a couple of uh, couple of uh, a couple of couples on one bike. And I think there was about six of us. And there's Eric there on my left on his Suzuki. But it, we, it took a while to get out of here, to get out of uh, the Panama area, about 45 minutes to get out of the Panama area before we're actually in the Kuna region. And, and um, it's a uh, it's a an indigenous region. They run the whole place, so they they get it. They get subsidised for electricity and all that sort of stuff. So they have power in there. But they don't have much else, um, and they self sufficient. But the place was beautiful and clean. You know, there wasn't a lot of rubbish around. There was a, a little bit around the foreshore, but that that doesn't matter when they shit in the ocean. Um, so all, they have their their outhouse, their toilets actually on the ocean. So not what I would consider to be too clever. Um, but anyway, they were pretty nice people. There was a bunch of them everywhere. They love their plastic, though. They have plastic bot. Uh, big cans everywhere for for storing stuff uh, stuff like that but it was you know it was quite a pretty little area like the the road uh, you know, we're coming up to it soon the road was for, for me I started out at 32 psi in the morning and it, for me that front tire was getting to be a real 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 big issue and yeah, Eric's talking to me now how fast um, how fast he was going and, and don't worry I noticed it too there he is up there in the on the left there. Um, I noticed it too. Yeah, that's right. He had the tire. Uh, he had an extra tire on the back. I don't know why people do that. Yeah, too. I don't know why people do. That. Obviously, it's uh, obviously better to have them. But riding with two tires, just all the time having that extra weight on the bike and just the, the pain in the ass of it. Um, you know what I did was basically. Weeks before I got somewhere, I just ordered ordered tyres and got delivered to KTM service places. 
So my whole trip, which is, you know, I, I probably only needed two sets of tyres, but I, took, I, I ended up doing three. And the reason for that is once I got to Santiago, Chile, I got another new set on, and I used the Hyde and our KT uh, TK60s. Um, and the reason, you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're great tyres and they'll go a long way. But the reason why I got another set was just because I was going into you know, a lot of off-roading from, uh, from San Diego down through Patagonia. Um, it wasn't, didn't it, you know, maybe a thousand miles off-roading, off but that's a lot. Um, that it, get him go. Uh, um, that it, that's a lot of miles to do off-roading, maybe even more than that. But, um, and, you know, with varying conditions, like some of it was in rain, and uh, it was always pretty cold and some of it was really tough, but it was great fun. I mean, uh, when you finish those off-roads, you don't like them when you're doing them, some of them. The real thick ripio, the real thick crushed rock. Is, uh, I, I always thought that I'm definitely gonna come off at some stage on that, but I got a lot more confident as, as I went along and, uh, and you know, yeah, just standing up on the pegs for so long, you know, it gets pretty tiring as well. But uh, yeah. I was hoping for a nice little ride. I don't know how much quicker we would have got there by doing all this weaving, but uh, he, he seemed uh, hell-bent on getting there early. And, the, and for all of us behind him, it was, hey, well, he knows where he's going. Most of us have only got a reasonable idea. And at this stage, I had no idea where we were going um, at, at, this, at this point. Um, there he is there. Um, and so basically I wanted to stick to him. I, I sort of haven't had an idea of what, where we had to get to, but um, so I just basically try to keep up with him uh, because I didn't want to get lost. Uh, and one of the guy, one of our guys did get lost. Um, uh, Eric, he, 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 he just got, got stuck behind and then just took a wrong turn, which was so easy to do. There was, if, once you've ridden this road to get there, you realize, God, you've got to go around. Luckily, I, I stuck him to the to the guy in front because otherwise it would have. There was all these little uh, turns we had to do to get to to the uh, to the main road to to get out of, to get out of this main uh, the high, main highway the this the Pan American. Um, and so we uh, yeah, just look at him go. <laughs> just bad. We're doing like I'm doing like yeah. Uh, what am I doing? 60 miles an hour here in the wet. You know, um, just, just just not necessary. You know, we're going to get there, mate. <laughs> but he just wanted to go, and it was pretty funny. Like I was actually laughing in my whole way. Through. This guy's just freaking insane. So here we are now. This is where we get onto the road to the um, to Porto Carti. This is a bunch of people we met along the way, and this is where we realised we'd lost Eric. Uh, so this this is the road. It's not too bad, but see that really hard rock, rocky surface. Um, it was pretty, and some of the corners it was really slippery because you had all that, uh, I don't know what the photo's doing there, uh, you had all that um, uh, moss and stuff like that on the road, so, and then coupled with the fact that my, my tyre had gotten down to about 12 psi, um, my front tyre, by the end of the trip I think I was at 11 psi, and you know, that's just not, not advisable on a, on a hard surface like that, you know soft surface like sand or something that's the sort of psi rating i'd have on my sand but um yeah so when you get to this region um it's this these roads are really nice getting out to here um but um once you get right into the forest it's uh it's a it's a whole a whole lot different um but it was it was a really nice ride and uh the weather got a little bit better for, for a little while and then started raining a little bit again. Um, but it was, uh, it was a fun ride. It was just nice to meet people from all over the world. We're talking Israel, Iran, um, Turkey, um, US, U UK, um, oh, just, just from everywhere. It was great. You know? um, geez, geez, I was getting close to the middle there. Um, yeah, I was just having all sorts of problems with my front tire, and when you go over these white, uh, these white things as well, 
So sometimes they put these arrows on the corners, you know, like just, you think, what the friggin' hell, like that, you know, like as you're entering a corner, they've got an arrow, why would they do that, you know? Um, and then there was one part of the, the road, so now we're getting into the thicker stuff, there was one part of the road that, that was just, it was like concrete, but it was like moss, it was unbelievable, and like a few of the bikes in front of me went, whoa, like they started slipping on it, you know? And it was just crazy. It was like only about 20 metres near a corner. Uh, it, was a, it was a T intersection, so it wasn't so bad. If it hadn't been a sweeping corner, we all, we all would have gone off one by one, one after another, you know? Uh, it was just madness. Like, I, because I saw the guys in front slip, I basically kept my bike straight, just, uh, just decelerated before I got there, so. Um, but, you yeah, know, they, they fishtailed a few of them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, and this is like the road was like at first, and then once we got closer, it started doing it. We had a lot of switchbacks, a lot of hairpin turns and stuff like that. Um, and then what happens is once, so this is about an hour and a, an hour and a quarter you're riding out this on this road. Uh, would have been not with a pretty day. It would have been so nice riding, you know, like a dry road and stuff like that, and with a decent front tire. Um, but this was my last riding day before I was going to get new tires put on it, so and get them fixed as well. You know, get that leak fixed. Hopefully, um, so you know, I suppose I've done now about about um, fifteen thousand kilometres, or maybe oh, sorry, about twelve thousand kilometres on these tyres. Um, so it was, you know, I didn't really need to change them. These tyres will go twenty thousand kilometres, um, but because of all the issues, I just wanted to get a fresh set on. Um, but you'll find that with all the weight on your bike, you'll find that your rear tire will wear a lot faster than your front tire. I probably would have only needed maybe, I might, not, I might have got away with just one, front, no front tire change at all the whole trip on 30 something thousand kilometers. Uh, seriously, there was just hardly any wear on it. The rear tire was pretty, um, that would get, once I got to about 15,000 kc, all that slippery stuff on the corners there. Um, once you get to about 15,000 k's, you're, um, the, the rear tire is losing everything that it had, but I still I never I never actually had a puncture of the tire on the whole trip. So you know I've got to say they're pretty darn darn good tires. The only time these tires, the height of let me down, was when it was a hard surface and slippery clay, um, or or just slippery, just any sort of mud. It just didn't handle it very well at all. And I've watched some reviews about it. People raved about it, but I think these people who were raving about it were, were people who were riding on roads, you know. And then I'd, I'd give it, if you were touring, I would give it, you know, four and a half stars if you're touring. But uh, off-roading, it would probably only get about three. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, even... even uh, I'm just trying to, I was just thinking that might have been the place where the concrete was, so it was just madness. Um, but it wasn't. Um, but uh, yeah, and and really, if you really want to have fun, you, I, I, I won't use those tyres again um, for any of the serious off-roading that I do on my next big trip because um, they just they just don't handle very well, and especially mainly at my width because at my width I don't have the grooves on the on the on the centre tread, while all the other sizes, smaller sizes, have the grooves on the tread, so. Yeah, so this this now and you know the last you know the last 45 minutes of this ride was through a little, fair bit of this sort of stuff and and then we started getting up high into high into some uh, ranges and uh, into rainforest and it was like really slippery for me. I was breaking way before the corners all the time and just trying to roll through the corners and keep the bike as straight as I could. I mean, even one of the other riders behind me said, "Geez, you're braking a lot," and I just said, "Yeah, mate, I was just like." I just didn't want to, I just wanted to roll through the corners. I didn't want to accelerate or break in any of the corners at all, you know. So I know that's not the most ideal thing to do, but I, my tyre was just, as soon as I started turning the tyre, uh, the front tyre was sort of just sort of feeling like it just wanted to wash out. And with all the leaves and stuff all over the road and the, and the moss and stuff like that, it was pretty, it was pretty, um, it was pretty slippery, you know. Um, but I still, I still try to enjoy it. Like I, driving it, riding in a straight line, and that I wasn't having any issues.
but it's a nice area. All farming, uh, they, they've got livestock, but they also do uh, uh, fruits and, uh, and all that sort of stuff, tropical fruits. Um, I don't know how, I think the, the federal government manages all the roads and all that sort of stuff, but uh, I think everything else, are from, apart from the infrastructure like electricity, water, I don't even know about water, whether they have their own water or they have water pumped in. Uh, they, 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 get a few, they get looked after pretty well uh, and left to their own. But you can be guaranteed there's no mineral resources out in this area because otherwise they would, like in Australia for instance, we're happy to live, let our Indigenous have certain rights, but as soon as uh, with uh, mining and that, yeah, not the same. Uh, we, you know, we just don't want to give up that you know, got, because Australia's whole wealth is tied to uh, tied to our mineral wealth, and that we've gone through some rocky years the last four or five years, only because all the oil, gas, coal, um, iron ore prices have been low. When they're up, Australia, Australia. You know, when the prices are up there, Australia's making, uh, Australia makes uh, uh, profits as a country, you know. Um, we have surpluses. But uh, the last four, five, six years, it's been down. So, yeah, um, and so I'll, I'll talk, I'll start talking now about, about the, pro obviously you're, you're watching how to get there. There's no actual maps. So once, you, you've basically got to uh, follow the directions uh, Star Route will give you some really rough directions. Um, you'll see on my on my uh, blog post the Rever app. I've got the mapping for it, but the Rever app basically gives you a straight line because it usually tries to stick it to a road. So wherever you go, it tries to stick to a road. So that didn't work. Um, just starting to bunch up a little bit here, but. Which I was happy about. I didn't care. I just wanted to sit and enjoy. I think I think Chris is in front of me. Um, and Chris is a guy I, I, I ended up meeting quite along the way and became pretty good friends with. He's a guy from the uh, from Wyoming and from somewhere else as well. He's from everywhere. And uh, he's travelling a lot. I think he's in Morocco. I spoke to him. We, we chatted on WhatsApp the other day. He he's in Morocco and uh, he, um, he he went all the way to Patagonia. He's, he's got a KLR and, um, you know, it's caused him some problems, but it's been, a, he bought it cheap and it's been a pretty darn good bike for him, you know. Um, and uh, he's, he's really enjoying it. He's just loving life and he just, just takes his time and has a few beers and relaxes. But um, he's got a lot of experience riding as well. A lot of off-roading experience, you know. He doesn't get out of his saddle though. He doesn't like it. He, he likes just sitting in his seat. But I suppose once you get onto the real rough stuff, you have to. You know, you have a choice of sitting in your seat. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, 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 out of the, all the people that I met here, I met uh, I met I, I forget it. It was really embarrassing when I was in Quito. Quito, um, I met um, I met one of the. Uh, one of the one of the guys and I actually thought he worked at the hotel. He's from Western Australia, and he came up to me on the street, um, and he said, "Oh, hey, how are you, mate? How, how you going?" And I, oh, good, good, good. And I was just not because I was I wasn't thinking about anybody any other riders. I was just thinking, "Hey, he works at the hotel," and he said, hey, "How's the bike going? Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. What have you been doing? Oh, I've just been training." And then I said, "I'm sorry, but..." I can't picture who, who, who are, because I started realising he's probably not at the hotel. He goes, I was on the Star Route with you. I thought, oh my God, how embarrassing. Yeah. Um, he was a really nice guy too. I don't know where he is. I didn't see him again after then. I saw Chris, um, obviously, um, I, and I also caught up with Sam as well again in, uh, in uh, on the Uni Salt Flats in Bolivia. Um, I didn't see any of the others. I was either ahead or behind. Uh, one of the groups came here, they were just riding straight to uh, Patagonia and and, uh, and back again. And they were just doing it like 800 kilometres a day, or 500 miles a day. Um, and they were doing it in like a month, like it was just madness. But they did it apparently. Um, I don't know how far south they actually got, but um, they were just pounding out the miles. So anyway, once you get on this road, you just keep following it along and then you'll come to a booth. Um, and at the booth, you you have to pay 
20 US dollars uh, entry fee, and this that actually gets you into the real Kuna, um, into, into this into the real region here, um, and um, and yeah, so you pay 20 dollars plus you pay three dollars, um, three dollar a three dollar fee. I'm not sure. At some stage here, one of the guys has an off too. I don't know if it's here or it'd be further down. But yeah, so there'll be a guy comes out. He had it. He had a, 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 a printing thing. I don't know whether he accepted credit cards, but take cash. Um, you don't want to be knocked back because you don't have the cash. So if you need to pay by credit card, ask to pay by credit card. If you don't have it, make sure you have the cash. So it's twenty dollars per person to get into the region, and three dollars per motorbike. So that fee is not covered in your star rent fee. I think mainly because like we had one guy who didn't show up, you know, I nearly went over over then. Uh, we had one guy who didn't show up and uh, Eric has, was lost. He turned up one, one hour and 45 minutes after we arrived and we'd already loaded all our bikes. The ship had already gone out off the dock because they pay by the hour. Here we are, this is where you, so there's a, tr there's a hut up on the right hand side. They've got their own local police. So. So the, yeah, the deal is basically, I think that's a military, yeah, it's a military police. So these military police, even though they're national, they're actually indigenous as well, so they're from this region as well. Everyone asks you the same questions. What kind of bike, how big it is, where are you going? And because I didn't have, because I put my own stickers on it, I didn't have uh, the KTM. There was little bits of KTM, you know, little insignias here and there, but it wasn't uh, like covering the bike type of thing. So yeah, look, um, for, for, for booking the, um, the Star Rat, I've, I've got links in my blog post on where you go and uh, and who you talk to. Um, but the thing is, they've got a, they've got a schedule, and so you've got to bef before you even trip, you want to basically plan around that. You know, even if you even if you give yourself plenty of time to get down to get down there. Um, and like with all toll booths and that, it's always good to have the right change and stuff. That's where we all where we all met up. <laughs> he was as crazy as guy. That's funny. So yeah, um, so. Once you get to the Star Rat, you um, so you keep riding along this road, and you'll come to this little community, and you'll see the ship out out on the out, out to sea or on the dock. Um, and you just as you get into the town, you'll weave right around the town. Then, sorry, then you'll go left, uh, left, and you'll go all the way to the jetty, and you'll ride your bike up onto the jetty. You might want to ask them if, if the boat is docked there. Uh, you might want to just ask if it's okay to ride up, and you just ride up on a little ramp and then right up onto the jetty. Um, we go from there. I kept my PSI was like, it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> I was thinking oh, I should I should basically, um, I should put my, um, I should put the compressor on and pump it up again, but you know, I didn't want everyone to be waiting around. You can see, look, I'm keeping the bike really straight as I go around the corners. Um, and yeah, we start, as, as we got deeper in here, we started getting some hairpins and stuff like that. So, and my bike just wasn't handling it. So everyone, everyone jumps, jumped further ahead of me. Um, and the thing is, I didn't want to have a friggin' off now. You know, like uh, even though I'm going pretty slowly, you just don't want to have an off. You know, when you've got a whole bunch of other riders around you and you've only got you know 20 miles or so to go. Um, 
that's the last thing you sort of want. No. Just take the wide approaches here. Um, but yeah, so once you get there, they um, they'll you'll park your bike up onto the jetty, and the, the ship will be there. When we got there, they were unloading from the from the guys coming from Cartagena back to Panama, which is apparently a lot less people do that trip. Um, than what we had. I think we had 16 bikes and about 20 people. And this, this trip was specially designed just for the motorbike riders. So there's only, only motorbikers on there, adventure riders on there. Um, and um, so when we got there, they were unloading those bikes. Once they'd finished unloading those bikes, they started loading out. So you take all your, all your uh, cases off, your, uh, everything off the bike, everything you need, because once they load the bike, Onto the onto the ship, you uh, they cover it up straight away, so they put it in a spot. So what they do is they tie a rope around it, and then they lower the winch and hook the winch into the rope. It's a pretty strong rope, like pretty thick rope, and they basically tie tie it up and and, uh, and then they winch it onto the boat, and the people on the boat put it into place, and then they uh, roll it off to wherever they want. You've got to leave it in neutral. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think I think we left the keys in them as well, um, and put them in put it in neutral. And uh, so they yeah they put them on the boat, and then what you, then what happens after that is you uh, is you get all your gear, and you've got to wait quite a while. Like we were probably there for two two and a half three hours all up, um, just waiting around and you know, for everything. And the boat would go out to sea and come back in, and then they put all your all your cases in a in a in a little skiff and take that out um, and then they load you into a little bit dinghy about four or five six at a time and they just do trips out to the boat you uh, then get all your gear and you just you're assigned a bunk each um, and you put all your gear with your with, with your bunk um, and you, we put our cases in a room all, all of our cases just any of your other gear I, I just have with my bunk yeah I, you know, I don't think there's any chance that any of the people on the boat are going to rob you because, you know, where can they go if everyone wants to check everyone out, but I'm sure it's probably happened before. Um, yeah, and then basically you, the, the first thing you do is they sit you upstairs on a, on a table, and a few people got a little bit pissed off about this, is that uh, there was a German girl on the boat. These are all volunteers, all the people that work on the boat, except for Ludwig, who's the captain. I'm pretty sure he makes a nice little packet out of it. You look at 20 riders, 20 people, $1,200 a person. That's 20 something grand, even though it's a not-for-profit, $20,000 for three-day trip. There would be costs involved, I've got no doubt, um, but I, I'm pretty sure it's a pretty lucrative little little business they've got running. Um, and it'd be pretty fun too. It's a beautiful boat, it's an old boat. Um, I didn't. I slept the first night downstairs in the dorm, but it was just so hot. I only got about four or five hours sleep and then I did the rest of my sleeping up on the, on the deck. And there's a really beautiful table area where you can sit around and there's also deck chairs and there's a couple of hammocks as well. Plus you can, um, you can also, uh, the, um, the, the bow of the boat, in front of the boat, there's a big rope thing that you can lay down on. Um, in nice season, it's, it's awesome. We had really good seas the whole trip pretty much. Um, yeah, a couple of guys got seasick, um, but we had really nice seas and uh, was playing out there. It was not exactly 100% comfortable, but it was fun. Um, the road's pretty strong and thick. You probably want to take out a little something to lie on and lay down on top of it before you lay down. It. It's not 100% comfortable. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of places where you can go on your own and sit down and read and stuff like that. It's a big, it's 100 foot, 100 foot, uh, plus foot long. Uh, and it's, it's a big, big boat. Um, and yeah, so a few people got their nose down to join a little bit because the, the girl who was uh, there was pretty, like, it, it's one of those things, you know, we, like when you go to a hotel room and you, you open the door and the first card you see is do not do this, do not do that, do not do this. It's a little bit annoying and basically that was what we had. You know, we were confronted with all the do nots you know, don't pee from the top deck, you know. Um, and uh, I tried to make a couple of jokes that didn't go that well, but down that well, but um, just all these different rules and uh, about food and, and uh, drinks and, um, 
you know, where you can do certain things and where you can't do them, uh, having a crap, what to do when you have a dump, um, all that sort of stuff. So, there's a, you know, that went for about 30, 34, 30, 30 minutes, the introduction. I, I, I didn't care. Like, I mean, I don't think she was that bad. I mean, I ended up talking to her a little bit. She, she was okay. I think she's pretty tired. Um, she was pretty tired, but it was a little bit of a... It sort of took a bit of the fun out of the first part of the trip, I, I, I will admit that. Um, but anyway, she was... Uh, uh, yeah, so basically they did that. Then after that, they just told you, OK, we're gonna, this is where we're going to sail to tonight, and we're going to drop anchor here. Um, and then you can go and have a swim at these uh, San Blas Islands. And it was pretty windy once we got out to sea. And it was a little bit windy and uh, the, the water was still nice. It wasn't really rough. I, I, was, I was the first off the ship in the water uh, and just jumped straight in. And um, the water was really nice and, you know, refreshing. And, uh, yeah, it was a little bit windy. It was blowing to one side, you know, so, you know, I just jumped on the side. I knew that it would blow me in the right direction. So, um, but it was, it, was, it was quite nice. We probably spent about an hour, two hours, uh, anchored there um, and you know they've got ta towels you should bring your own towel but they had towels um, they've got uh, if you want a, uh, a kayak they've got kayaks paddle boards um, they've got all that sort of stuff so um, you can you can do what you like and they even uh, they even had a little boat I don't know, some of the people got on a boat and they took them back in and then at that place there was where we picked up like about 50 lobsters crayfish and, um, and that was going to be our dinner. And it was sensational too. Uh, I really, really liked it. And that was the best dinner of the whole trip, actually. Um, the rest of it was all like beans and stuff. It was all, it was all fine. I didn't worry about it. A few of the other people thought it was a bit, for the $1,200, thought we would got a bit more than that. But the first night's meal was really nice. Rice and, bean, uh, rice and uh, this big, uh, like, it was like a crayfish sort of, Oh, that's right. So this, what happened here is one of the guys came off. And this is on a bit of a hill, uh, so I went up the hill a bit and I parked my bike um, up here, got right up the top of the hill, and walked back down and uh, we helped him out uh, getting his bike. Getting his bike uh, back on the road, he went into the uh, ditch. Apparently, a, a car came the other way as he was coming around the corner, and it, um, I think he came around the corner a bit wide and it just spooked him a bit. He just got out the way. I don't think he was that experienced a rider, but um, yeah. there's my there's my bike going on the uh, on the Star Rap. Unfortunately, I didn't realise it until, until I put it on the dock and I didn't realise until afterwards that they were already hoisting it. So there's all the bikes lined up, there's a the star wrap. Um, yeah, so that was pretty cool. There's a British guy there, he had, he had this really nice Triumph, Triumph Tiger, really pretty bike, that, that's it there. Nice. There's the ship. So it takes a while once you get there, you'll be there for two or three hours I imagine by the time they unload and load, load you up. Um, and there's the little boats and all the locals there are helping out, you know, they all make a little bit of money. I'm sure they, they get charged, you know, they probably make about a thousand dollars out of having that boat there for, that, for, the, for a few hours. Helping one bit. But anyway, if you've got any questions or comments about this, I'm gonna the next trip is gonna the next video is gonna be on the actual trip. So uh, I'll talk to you soon. Questions or comments below, thank you.